Ah, thank you. <gasps> She's starting and I'm starting. Okay, first of all, I'm very, very happy to be here today and uh, happy also to share some insights from the space industry. And uh, let's start. Uh, many people might question why space? Of course, because Earth depends on it. Sometimes we tend to forget that we actually live in space. Um, just very briefly, I started my company Umbilical Design in 2001, and that was directly after my master degree of uh, industrial design from Lund Institute of Technology. And then people, of course, told me here in Sweden that, Cecilia, you can't start a space design company in Sweden. So that's one of the attitudes that we need to have not in Sweden anymore, I hope. Uh, from the beginning, we were focusing only on design for outer space and extreme environments and working both with NASA and the European Space Agency. Uh, many people tend to ask about the name, and umbilical is, of course, a space term and is used about everything that connects two things in space. And uh, if we translate it, it's, of course, navelstreng. Uh, and uh, we want to be the creative link into big complex projects and really work with creativity and innovation. But it all started with this little vehicle, the crew return vehicle. It started as a diploma work for NASA and European Space Agency. And when we came to NASA, the, the head of the crew return vehicle project told us, oh, so you're the Swedish designers that are going to hang some curtains in the windows. I guess it was because we were three girls and one guy. So we decided to actually work with the whole interior of this little vehicle. And um, when you see this image, you might even understand more why I like to work in this industry, because then you can go up flying with these parabolic flight planes. It brings you up and down, and on each top you are weightless for approximately 30 seconds. And then you can try the prototypes and actually understand how it feels to be an astronaut in outer space. It's great, you should try it. And it's fun because they repeat it not only once, but 30 times you go up and down like this. So it's like two and a half hour flight. Strongly recommended. Um, if you see those red arrows over here, the people at NASA saw them also, and we had a telecon. We were going back and forth to NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, working with this project, but also had telecons from Lund. And then the NASA people asked us, what, what are these red arrows? And we said, these are uh, illustrating a damping system, so the astronauts will have a better landing. And then the question was back to us, uh, but how will that work? And we as design and architect uh, students, we had no idea. And our professor was uh, uh, with us at this telecon, and he said, probably one of your 8,000 engineers, engineers might solve this for us. And it was quiet for a while, and then we heard, yes. <laughs> That's also why I like to work with this uh, space industry, because they can transform red arrows into damping systems. They just didn't know it before. So it's all about communication, isn't it? Uh, talking about collaboration with astronauts, we had a team of six astronauts helping out in the project, led by our Swedish astronaut, Christer Fuglesang. And that was also very uh, troubling for NASA. How come that these astronauts help these Swedish students? Six astronauts putting effort and time into this project. And we thought we could be helpful and actually explain why, because we actually asked the astronauts what would be helpful in this uh, uh, interior for you and when it becomes an emergency situation. So it's, again, it's about communication and actually asking and involving people in your project. So we changed the, the total uh, interior of the vehicle. And the, the major thing was that instead of having a flat floor with seven seats placed upon the floor structure, we integrated the seats in the floor structure instead. So that saved a lot of weight, and that's very important in the space uh, industry because it costs uh, about $10,000 per kilo what you decide to actually bring to space. Um, and we also uh, actually calculated exactly how much volume we could save and give to the technical systems so we could show the engineers what we as designers and architects could actually bring to a project like this. And after that, there, were there has been no more talking about curtains for 14 years now. 
Um, so I really fell in love with this industry and decided to start my own company and actually put Sweden on the international space design scene, which seemed very reasonable from the US side, but Sweden were very puzzled. Uh, after working a couple of years uh, with the continuing with the crew return vehicle, but also for planned habitation for Moon and Mars, we realized that all these ideas we could transfer inf into concepts like volume management, and we could actually transfer them to projects here on Earth. So one example was that I, I gave a call to Scania and told them that we see similarities between your truck drivers and our astronauts. I was very quiet in the phone, and I said, we don't really see it, but it seems very exciting, so let's start a project. <laughs> and we said, okay, let's do that. So um, what we did was actually, it was not about transferring materials and technologies. It was only about looking into the situation for the astronauts. So in weightlessness, you can actually use all surfaces, so all surfaces becomes equally important. And we transferred that idea of thinking into the Scania truck cabin, and a lot of exciting ideas, of course, evolved. So that's one thing how we can transfer also concep concepts into the, uh, into the Swedish industry. The other thing we work a lot with is something we call weightless thinking, and that's more about to involve the zero gravity factor into the design process. So... Here we really look into how can we find unique solutions inspired by the space sector. For example, spacesuits, could it be our new homes? Um, I mean, when the astronauts are out on a spacewalk, they actually are protected only by like six centimeters. So how come that we need 60 centimeters thick um, walls in our, in our uh, buildings. So that's one really exciting example that we look into right now. Like the suit, they have 19 layers uh, and it uh, protects the astronaut from this extreme environment. So this is really ex exciting and a project that we are into at the moment. So the work with space technology transfer is really exciting. So that came to be our major uh, area of, of work for, for Umbilical. Just to give you a a quick insight in what it could be. It has been everything like uh, uh, sailing suits for extreme sailing inspired by the Mars rover's tires. We could transfer this into a textile that could actually protect uh, the sailors better for these extreme sailing environments. And also bicycles with more lightweight materials. And one big sector is, of course, the building sector, uh, which is really exciting, where we think we can bring a lot of knowledge from, from the space sector. Um, after working a while, sometimes you are happy to get nominated to, like in this case, the Globe Award 2008 for the work we have been doing so far in space technology transfer and sustainability. And um, this was a really bo boundlessness meeting, I would say, because we have me here to the left and the Crown Princess Victoria and the man in yellow over here. I can assure you, he, he entertained us all night. <laughs> Tell you more later about that. Um, I think it's important when you got these nice uh, prizes and nominations. It's really interesting to see how, so you don't get too confident. And of course, you should be happy, but you should think how could it proceed for a next step. So for us, the nomination actually brought us into the major project that we work with at the moment that we call Down to Earth. So it's all about commercializing space technologies for a sustainable Earth. And here we work with space agencies and companies and universities to develop sustainable solutions. And where we had the first projects exhibited at the Shanghai World Expo in, in Shanghai, 2010. Um, so what we see all the time and what we try to, uh, to, to, to change and really inspire other industries is to use uh, all these kind of new technologies that is not normally uh, used in the industry. Here we have a space shower, actually. So uh, in space, they need to stand in this kind of tube thing. And here you have a sponge floating around just a little bit wet sponge. So that's the way they take a shower in space. So they don't use so much wa water, and that's actually what we want to bring into as a new kind of thinking, like an astronaut living style on Earth, because we also have to be very careful of how we use water 
nowadays. So maybe this should be uh, one of our transfers. That at least he looks very happy, don't he? Um, I don't have so many figures in my presentations. I almost always have one, and that's uh, number 20. Because me, most people don't know about the value that uh, space brings to Earth. And actually, here in Europe, for all invested euro into the space sector, it comes back uh, times 20 to the society. Uh, our, our American colleagues, of course, say we can double that. <laughs> so we need to get inspired from, from that as well, of course. Just to give you one uh, brief idea about uh, a project we worked with for Academia, where we looked into more of these con conceptual ways of thinking, where we said, how is the education of the future? Do we really need a school at all? Could, it, could a school be something else? Do we need a building? So here the idea was to maybe we can put people on a train and call it for training. I've been working a lot with Gothenburg, <laughs> you see. <laughs> 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 and um, um, yeah, that's my kind of people. <laughs> um, and and here it was really exciting because we were thinking about like sending out astronauts in in outer space. It's the same thing. Let's put students on trains and send them out and have them work with innovation on trains. So that was one of the concepts that we showed in the space innovation module in Shanghai. And while being in Shanghai, we realized that Shanghai and Gothenburg are sister towns. So that's what brought us to Gothenburg and working, starting working with uh, several companies in Gothenburg. And that also made us bring this project training into action, working with the Gothenburg companies. We actually could put 80 students from Tongji University uh, traveling eight days and night, working with our concepts from Shanghai to Helsinki. It was really, really exciting results that came out of that. And now we are looking into new corporations and doing this kind of training all over the world, actually, together with United Nations and the World Tourism Organization. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, this is really exciting to see what it can bring into people's life, doing a journey, but in the same time working with innovation. And this is something we can actually, the Trans-Siberian Railway is what we can, what the astronauts can see from outer space. But what they don't see is the boundaries between countries. And that's something that the astronauts say to me, that's what they like the most is actually to look down on our little blue planet and realize uh, that they see one planet. It's no boundaries at all. And I think that's one thing that the astronauts want to bring up all decision makers into space and have them see our little blue planet. Uh, so I think that is maybe our next project to be. Uh, some final reflections. Uh, what we learned is it's all about this cross-fertilization and teamwork. Uh, it's like to have this... If this uh, Formula One driver would only be surrounded, surrounded by medical doctors, we all know it would not be a good team. But in the same way, we always have the same people around us. So I think that's something we really need to change and work with people of different disciplines. And always challenge your clients. Remember that strongly. Yeah, that's very, very important. So you, you take responsibility for what you actually develop for, for our planet. And of course, it takes courage to do that. But I know you have it inside you. Even the Swedish people, I hope. I still have hope. Uh, and it takes courage to look at this um, little image. So we will not look uh, so long time at this one. This is actually a sketch made by our Swedish astronaut, Christer Fuglesang, when we were out in a bar. He made this sketch on a napkin for me. It's uh, about the universe. So I wanted to share this with you, but we look at a short while because it's, uh, it's a bit troubling because 5% of the universe, it's what he called matter. That's what we know. 30% uh, is dark matter. And here he writes, lite aning. We know a little. 65% is dark energy. And here he writes, absolute ingen aning. Absolutely no idea. So you see, it's, it's a bit troubling to look at, but also inspiring that we need to continue to explore. And uh, to explore, the most important thing is what I call the why not people. 
Uh, and I recently heard that uh, after one month, you only remember 1% of a, a lecture. So I like to summarize my lecture in two words, and they are why not. It's the most important thing for tonight. So why not people? I used to say that I collect on the why not people, and they are extremely important. Because it's the people that actually say, when they are affronted by a bit strange, odd projects, they could actually say, why not? And I think these people are the most important people for innovation and growth for our country. And by that, I want to say thank you all for listening. <laughs> <laughs>